everyone. I'm Liz Bothwell from Waste 360, and we are in our next week of unpacking recycling with Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Liz. So glad to be to be talking today. Me too. And today we're covering glass, and I know you have a lot to share. And I just read that 3.1 million tons of glass containers were recycled in the U.S. in in 2018. So we're talking about quite a bit, and that's about 31% recycling rate. So I know you have a lot to share, especially with your perspective being in D.C. So please start. Much appreciated. And you're exactly right. We have a lot of glass that we're producing. We use glass for a lot of different packaging types, whether for alcohol and liquor or for jams and peanut butter and you name it. Um, It's in a lot of different formats across the board. And we generate a lot of it in part because it's pretty heavy material. So when we think about the number of packages that are out there, we might have might not have as great a number of glass packages on shelves, but when we think about solid waste and recycling, we use weight as the measure. So when we see those really big glass numbers, that's often why, because it just happens to be a heavier material. So that's helpful to keep in mind as as we think about glass packaging as a whole. But you're exactly right. We recycle a pretty decent portion of it, about 30%, but that's definitely not as high as we would like. And the glass recycling landscape has changed a lot in in recent years as well as over the past few decades. And unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but of course, the the kinds of packaging that we see in the marketplaces changes really rapidly. And and glass packaging peaked in terms of the amount we were producing in, in the 80s a few decades ago and has been kind of slowly reducing as we use more and new novel formats, lots of those multi layer packages and stand up pouches and things like that that you see all the time. So we're producing a little bit less of it now than we used to in the past. And we've been recycling a pretty stable amount, about 30 percent or so, about a third um, over uh, over the past handful of years. But it does vary based on the packaging type. So we don't recycle the same rate of jars as we do to bottles. And there's lots of different considerations to, to think through when we want to recycle those and when we might not, as well as their lids and their labels. Um, we get lots of questions on Twitter from folks who are confused about you know, do I recycle a beer cap on its own when I'm drinking a glass beer bottle from a glass beer bottle? Do I reattach the the lid on the jar of jam that I just finished before tossing it into the blue bin? And the answer is often that it depends. So something that I know we touched on uh, last week, um, a week or two ago in our paper episode was that Uh, You can't recycle anything, unfortunately, that's smaller than two inches by two inches. So anything in the recycling stream that's smaller than that, unfortunately, will be a contaminant. And we've not really unpacked why it's problematic and what it's contaminating. And the answer is glass. So glass, we all know, breaks. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's broken some drinking glasses or knocked a wine glass off the counter at some point or another or you know, had a jar slip from my hand. So we know in the recycling system that glass will break as it gets transported to a recycling facility and as it goes through the sorting process. So recycling facilities were designed to capture all of those small broken pieces as glass. And that means that anything small that we put into the recycling system will erroneously get captured with that glass because the recycling facility is designed to think that anything small means that it's glass. But we know that's not the case, and unfortunately, small items get into the recycling system and contaminate it all too often. All right, so I'd love to talk through a handful of glass packages that we have and look about and talk about what we can and can't recycle within them and, and how we should be putting them into a blue bin. So here we have a, a tonic bottle, a glass bottle. We want to be recycling the bottle, but unfortunately, the metal cap that's on the top just like your average metal beer cap, is unfortunately too small to be recycled. It's under that two inch by two inch size threshold. So if we were to put it into the blue bin, this would end up contaminating the glass that the recycling facility is pulling out and and hoping to recycle. The same goes for um, for things like corks or, or metal caps of wine bottles. So these, once the glass bottle breaks, the metal will be left over and contaminating the glass. So I would wanna remove this and unscrew it before I toss it into the blue bin. Um, And for something like a a big, heavy, reusable glass container, glass is a wonderful material to reuse. It's what we consider GRASS, generally recognized as SAFE. That's the kind of jargony acronym that the FDA has that means that this material is really safe to use over and over. We can clean it really well with hot water and in a commercial scale facility and, and put new milk or whatever you want back into it. 
Um, the plastic component here, though, when we do eventually recycle this, would likely contaminate the, the glass that, that's being collected in the system. This, of course, is much tougher to remove than something like a metal cap or a cork. Um, but uh, just to, to keep in mind that that's something that, that we want to think about when we're recycling the glass item. But something like this glass jar, where the lid is above two inches by two inches, we would be able to recycle. And folks often ask, do you want to reattach it? Do you want to recycle it loose into the system? And the answer is that it doesn't really make a difference because we know that the glass is going to break. I probably would just toss it into the blue bin for the hell of it. We want to, in practice, always keep separate materials separate. So that's kind of just a best practice that I like to not even think about and just try and do my best across the board. But because we know that this is big enough above our two inch by two inch threshold, we can toss that into the blue bin as well. And that'll get separated and, and pulled out of the system. But one of the challenging things about glass recycling is that because we do have so many small contaminants in the system today, is that the glass that we collect in single stream curbside programs is unfortunately pretty low quality. So today we're recycling a lot of small items when we don't want to be and we're erroneously contam contaminating the glass. So we want to be doing as best a job as we can to remove that and reduce that. But unfortunately today it's often too low quality to recycle when it's collected in a single stream curbside system. So in DC, for instance, where we are, unfortunately, our single stream recycling system has a lot of small contaminants in it. So the glass that we produce is really low quality. When you see it coming out of the recycling facility, there's little bits of shredded paper in it. There's metal caps, there's plastic film. Um, it's not looking so great. And it's not something that would be of a high enough quality that a glass manufacturer would want to take back. So what a lot of communities are starting to do is to separate glass and collect it separately from the start. And that way it's a really high quality, high enough quality to recycle and do something a high, that's a higher and better use. But what a lot of communities do right now for that low quality glass when they're collecting it in single stream programs is they use it for what we call alternative daily cover or ADC. An alternative daily cover basically means a layer of stuff that they put on top of a landfill every day to try and mitigate emissions. So in a landfill, we know that you know there's not a whole lot of oxygen and what happens to food waste and organic materials like paper when you put it in is that it breaks down and it emits methane, which is a really harmful greenhouse gas, much more harmful and potent than carbon dioxide. Uh, and what glass is used for in DC, in the DC region today, is, is alternative daily cover to try and suppress those methane emissions. So it's not the highest and best use. We want it to be going back into glass bottles and figuring out a way to recycle it better, but it is going to some productive use as opposed to being kind of commingled in the normal refuse stream. So it's it's kind of the lesser of, of the evils and we're working really hard to figure out a way that we can, can better separate glass from the start. And a lot of the communities in Northern Virginia around us have all banded together and it's been really exciting to see them start dedicated glass drop-off programs where folks can bring the material and they've been seeing incredible uptake where people really want to go out of their way to bring glass to a space where they know it's gonna be recycled and put back into a bottle since it's endlessly endlessly recyclable and reusable. We talked a little bit in our plastics and paper episodes about how you can only recycle each kind of material, both plastic and paper, about five to seven times before the fiber and plastic chains get shorter and shorter and shorter and too short and tired to use. Glass isn't the same way. So glass can be recycled and reheated and reformatted into new glass packaging really infinitely if, if we take care of it and source separate it and, and keep it in, in, a, in a clean, high quality stream, which is really exciting. But one of the trade-offs with that is that facilities have to use a ton of energy to heat up furnaces to melt it all down. So glass often has to be recycled at 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, something up in that in that ballpark, a lot of energy. So we do see that the carbon footprint op often of glass packaging might be higher than a paper package or a plastic package. If you see, you know, a jar of glass jam next to a jar, uh, a plastic container of jam, the carbon footprint of the plastic container might be lower than the glass container. And depending on where you are, the recyclability might be different. So in DC, we can recycle plastic containers, rigid plastic containers really well. We have a great end market for it. But unfortunately, right now in DC and in many communities, there isn't yet that, that end market for glass when they're collecting it in a single stream system. So we're really excited to see more and more communities dedicated glass drop-off programs that are, are being kicked off. 
Um, and it's, it's really common elsewhere in the world. So if you're in Europe or Canada, there's a lot more higher prevalence of, of glass drop-offs to make sure that the material is kept to itself and clean and high quality and that it can be reused and recycled back into, into new products. And when it comes to, to other contaminants or questions that folks have about contaminants for glass packaging, folks often ask about the labels for glass packaging. So uh, this glass jar has a paper label and that's totally fine. Um, paper will be burned off in that really hot, high furnace, so it's not going to be a problem. You don't have to go out of your way to take it off if you don't want to. You're more than welcome to if, if you're so inclined. Um, or, or things like limes and lemons. If you ever slot a lime or lemon into your beer while drinking it into a glass beer bottle, that's really okay too. That's not going to be a really meaningful problematic contaminant, and, and the glass manufacturers can, can take care of that pretty easily. Oh, that's good to know. I feel like that's one of the biggest questions I get, the lime and the lemon. When people figure out what I do for a living, they, they're like, Is it, will this contaminate? Will it render it useless? So that's a great answer there. Yeah, absolutely. I honestly didn't realize it myself since I always want to err on the side of caution. And if I'm ever curious about whether something might be a contaminant or not, until I figure it out, always want to err on the side of caution and make sure something heads to the trash bin instead of contaminating the recycling bin. Absolutely. And I mean, you touched on this a little bit, Charlotte, but I think the pandemic really took a toll on glass recycling and we saw a lot of pullback from programs. Do you think, and it sounds like it, but do you think there's sort of a revitalization of these programs with some of these grassroots efforts that you're talking about? Yeah, I think there definitely are exciting grassroots efforts out there. There's some really exciting kind of grassroots volunteer led programs in New Orleans, for instance, where they weren't satisfied with the glass recycling options that were being provided to them by the city and the county and started some glass recycling programs of their own, which is, you know, and we don't want people to be in the positions where they're feeling like, you know, the services that they have access to aren't sufficient enough to the point where they need to do it themselves. But it's really heartening to see people caring enough that they want to make sure that it happens if it's not happening today. And there's some kind of in-between strategies that a lot of communities are starting to think through as well. So we know that alternative daily cover for landfill is not a great end use for glass. It's a really valuable material. Sand that goes into it is a, a finite resource. It's, you know, takes a really long time for the earth to replenish sand and it's being extracted at a really high rate. So we don't want that to go to a landfill if we can reuse it and recycle it. Uh, but a lot of communities are thinking through ways that they can use glass packaging and recycle glass locally if they don't have access to a glass manufacturer. So we've seen over the past handful of decades consolidation of glass manufacturing facilities and uh, bigger facilities less frequently um, or, or more sparsely geographically populated. So in D.C., for instance, once we do get a program started that's store separating glass and giving people the option to make sure it's going to a dedicated recycling stream, the nearest glass facilities to us are in New Jersey and North Carolina, which isn't out of the question to haul glass to, but because glass is so heavy, you can only put so much of it on a truck before the truck needs to kind of tap out and, uh, and, and haul the material. And that threshold is about 20 to 21 tons, something in that, in that ballpark uh, before it kind of weights out. So that's pretty unusual. Most materials you can kind of fill a truck up with and you won't reach and have that weight threshold as a problem. So a lot of people are thinking through how we can process it and use it locally. And some communities are starting to grind glass into sand, back into mm -hmm. sand, and then use that sand for other uses like stormwater and, and disaster applications where you might be needing to distribute thousands or tens of thousands of sandbags to, to communities when there's storms or flooding. That's definitely a productive end use and something that is really important for life safety and for, uh, for preserving people property. We're also seeing it being used more and more in, in aggregate and construction applications as well as fiberglass. So if you recycle glass and store separate glass, it can go into other applications like fiberglass insulation um, as well. It doesn't necessarily have to go back into a glass consumer product good or a glass package to, to have kind of a, a happy end story there. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of folks are also really excited about thinking through different types of glass like uh, window glass or Pyrex or um, ceramic glass. And unfortunately, that's a different kind of glass, kind of the, the chemical makeup of that kind of glass is, is different from the soda lime glass that, that we recycle today. So something like um, my coffee mug, the ceramic, this isn't a type of material that we would be able to introduce into the recycling stream and have recycled with, with something like this. Um, so it, it's helpful to keep in mind. And, and for a lot of folks, it's not immediately 
intuitive why that might be the case. So it's always helpful to be clear when, when you're a community or have any recycling signage or messaging that you're putting out um, that we want kind of container glass, glass bar, uh, bottles and jars um, instead of kind of glass is, a, is an entity since to the average person that might mean a lot of things. That might mean the windows that I have next to me or my glass mug or you know my glass baking dish. Um, so we wanna be, be mindful of the kind of glass we're recycling also. That makes sense. And so, Charlotte, do you think that our, our modern MRFs will ever be able to handle glass in the single stream, considering that it does become a contaminant in and of itself? I think there's a possibility, and I think that there's some exciting innovation that's happening to add glass cleaning equipment early on in the process at MRF. So one of the problems that we're, we're uh, ending up with the situation right now at MRFs at recycling facilities is that we're waiting to the very end to separate glass and pull glass out of the system. But we're currently thinking through ways that we can use technology and, and a, a different staging of the order of how materials are separated to try and pull that glass out first. And that would be beneficial not only to the glass, but also to the paper in the stream. So when you put all of the materials into the same blue bin, one of the consequences is that when glass breaks, glass shards tend to contaminate the paper stream. And of course, we don't want glass shards in our paper, uh, in our paper recycling supply. So that's something that also might be improved by pulling glass out earlier on in the process and investing in, in some of that equipment that MRFs might not have today. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And so our favorite question of the day, what is your most interesting uh, question that you get around glass on Twitter? Yeah, I think that um, the most interesting question uh, I get is, is what happens to glass and, and why we consider alternative daily cover to, to be a beneficial reuse strategy and can we really consider it recycling? And it's a really valid question. And I think a lot of people feel a little bit turned off when they realize their community might be doing this. And it's very understandable that I think a lot of people mentally have in their mind that glass is a really high quality material, highly recyclable, and that's all true. But the way that we're collecting it today means that it's pretty challenging to recycle in some parts of the country. So I think that a lot of folks ask those very kind of interesting conceptual questions about what qualifies as recycling and what doesn't. And and I really try and, and recommend that, you know, communities that aren't recycling glass to uh, kind of a highest best use putting it back into glass containers today be honest about it because what's really damaging is when people find out that it's not being recycled even though it's accepted in the blue bin and it's being used for something else without that transparency and I think a lot of people feel like the rug is being pulled out from under them and I, I don't blame them at all so I think that that's one of the most common questions is what does alternative daily cover mean why is it going to a landfill why can't we bring it to a glass recycling facility and of course there's kind of those those number of reasons about we need to make sure it's really high quality and we need to make sure that we can can truck it to a facility that's within kind of the distance that we can put heavy material on a big truck. Um, so it's it's something that I think people are, are definitely becoming increasingly aware of and, and caring about. And I think that that interest and awareness is is channeled into a lot of productive uh, productive ways to, to help build those dedicated glass recycling drop offs that, that we really need to make sure we can recycle it genuinely. Absolutely. And to your point, transparency is key. As long as we all know what's happening, I think everyone will be okay with it. And like you said, find alternative uses for it. So, well, thank you so much. Again, this is amazing. Um, you just give so much insight within a really short period of time. So thank you again for talking glass. And if anyone has any questions, please reach out to Charlotte. She will answer them on Twitter. <laughs> certainly do my best. Thanks so much, Liz. Really appreciate it. Thank you. See you all next week.